there, acupuncture aficionados, e-stem. Some people love it, some hate it. But how can you utilize it in your traditional Japanese acupuncture and moxa practice? And is it the right choice for your practice? Well, you're in the right place because today we're gonna to be diving straight into why e-stem may not be the best fit for your traditional Japanese acupuncture and moxa stimulation. I'm Maya Suzuki from Shinkyu University, and by the end of this video, you'll understand why e-stem may not be the best approach to fit into your traditional Japanese acupuncture and moxa practice, and also how to enhance your practice without e-stem. Now, if you're really interested in advancing all aspects of your traditional Japanese acupuncture, acupuncture and moxa practice, then you're going to want to set up an interview to see if Shink University is a good fit to advance your practice and your goals in life. If you would like to do that, you can go ahead and find a link to that interview in the description box below. If you're new here, do make sure to like, subscribe, and of course hit that little bell to be notified of future videos all about traditional Japanese acupuncture and max question. Now before we dive into it, let me tell you a little bit about why I 15 years ago decided to never use e-stem in my personal treatments. Okay, so I was living in Japan and apprenticing at Acura Acupuncture Clinic, and now this was even before I went into school at Toyoshi and Kusamon Gakko, so I knew absolutely kiss about acupuncture. I knew nothing aside from what I saw in the practitioners and what I experienced. And I was enamored with everything that they did and they used a lot of e-stem. And because I was so keen to learn everything I could, I got a lot of treatment. And something I learned really quickly was that my personal body, it was just really sensitive to e-stem. It made me hurt. It felt jarring and overwhelming. And I really didn't seem to think it helped me attain my health goals. So in short, I didn't like it. So my initial intro to e-stem definitely wasn't a positive one for my body. And after that, I started studying at school and particularly in Iyashinomichi and realized that there was actually a reason why it felt so awful for me. So I'll go into that in a bit, but as a disclaimer, if you love e-stem, then just realize that there is a particular body type out there that likes e-stem and that's totally okay. Understanding traditional acupuncture and max best, you have to realize that e-stem is not a part of it because it involves electricity. However, it does stimulate kind of like some traditional techniques. So let's talk more about that. E-stem or electroacupuncture involves passing electrical current through the needles. While this can be effective in some contexts, it tends to clash with the core principles of traditional Japanese acupuncture and mox question, which relies really on nuanced understanding of the body's responses and of course the key movement and minimal stimulation really enough to help the body react, but not enough to be overwhelming. What that means, and really just as a disclaimer, I'm going to talk a lot about Yokota Kampu Sensei, who is the head of Yashinomichi, about his vantage point on e-stem and why he also says that e-stem might not be the best approach for a traditional Japanese acupuncture approach. I'm just gonna put in another disclaimer. If you love e-stem, you love e-stem, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying from a very traditional kind of return to the classics perspective, perspective, e-stem is not very traditional, right? Like they didn't have electricity, so they couldn't have e-stem. The reason why Yokota Kampa Sensei often says that e-stem is not a good fit with traditional Japanese acupuncture or with the body in general is that he goes on to explain in many of his books that when you instill e-stem, what it is doing is trying to consistently move the needle back and forth to create stimulation to the body. Now, there's a lot of acupuncture techniques in TJM that do provide that kind of stimulation to the needle. Those are really, really great and effective techniques. The problem with e-stem though, is because the practitioner is not providing that stimulation, we never really know when the body has had enough. Meaning that when the key arrives to that needle, disperses to that needle, whatever we're trying to attain, when that happens, that's when the technique should then end. So when the key arrives at the needle, that's when the technique is no longer needed. And also when the needle is no longer needed. In most TJM, I would say in all of the TGM approaches that I've learned about so far, I'm sure that there's one or two that are, there's always something that's gonna be different, but. And so what happens with e-stem is because you put it on a timer essentially, and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna stimulate this for 10 minutes. What you could end up doing is overstimulating the body. 
And that becomes really jarring. So going back to my original experience with e-stem, it felt jarring and then eventually painful. It's because it gathered too much key. I'm very sensitive as a person and it would gather too much key at that needle tip. And that would be really, really painful for me because it was too much. My body didn't need that much. But because there was no person holding on to that handle and understanding like, hey, the keys arrived, this is enough. It just keeps stimulating the body. And that becomes too much treatment, what we call over treatment or an improper treatment for the client. So you can understand how using e-stem can be too much treatment. There's another idea that Yoko Dokampu Sensei also often talks about, which is how e-stem forces the key to react. So just to go into a little bit of that, when we have a really gentle stimulation, let's say we have a really deficient client and we're forcing through continued stimulation of the needle, we're gonna force that key to come up and surround the needle. Not all people, some people this can be beneficial because it helps to bring up their key when it was really, really low and deficient. But for some people who are very deficient, what ends up happening is you have to steal your body's key from a place where it's really, really important, perhaps where it's retreated and receded internally to really protect the body. And then it forces it to come to this needle. And so that can be really aggressive. And for a lot of really deficient and exhausted clients, really, it can be really tiring for them. And so that makes it, again, this is an improper over treatment, but just to explain it from another perspective as well, especially if you're not a very technique heavy practitioner, that you can also force the key in a way that's really unbeneficial for your client and make that client even more exhausted, even more deficient because you're sealing key from very vital areas and forcing it to come to stomach 36 or whatever, when in fact you should have been really tonifying the yin instead. What e-stem ends up doing is, well, at least what I've seen a lot of practitioners do, and again, there's always gonna be someone who's using it really, really well and it's very beneficial for them. So if that's you, no big deal. But what I often see happening, especially for newer practitioners, is they rely on e-stem because they're not really sure how to create a technique that can help draw the key to specific areas. And what ends up happening is they kind of disregard how the body is presenting and what they really are having to treat for that day, whether that be yin deficiency or whatever. The last and final reason why I think e-stem does not have a place in traditional acupuncture and mock Sebastian, definitely of course in Iyashi no Michi, but in most styles, is that it's really not subtle at all. And if there's one thing I can say about TJM in comparison to, for example, TCM or the styles of classical Chinese acupuncture I've been fortunate enough to see is that most styles of TJM are quite subtle. And even if they aren't subtle, even if they still are using like the big long needles, they're still being very specific about how they utilize those needles. And unfortunately, e-stem is just not a subtle technique. It's I kind of equate it to like throwing spaghetti on the wall. I've seen e-stem be really effective for some things, but I would say in the end, if you can be subtle with your technique and have a really good moxa practice, you're often more effective if you just take e-stem out of the picture because it's so aggressive. And for most practitioners, it's a lot like throwing spaghetti on the wall. Now, because of all of these things that I've already talked about, e-stem really can be overstimulating. It can be very painful, it can be aggravating of symptoms, and it really just doesn't affect the body in the way that most TGM approaches are looking to affect it. Now, in contrast to this, I'd like to talk a little bit more about how TGM techniques, in particular, some techniques of the Sugiyama Waiichi style, and then techniques of other styles as well, can be more precise and more subtle at stimulating the body's key and get better feedback, better patient results. One of the techniques that e-stem often looks like, honestly, is Nenshin technique. Now, Nenshin technique is a fluttering technique, I guess you could call it. A direct translation would be a gentle drill technique, as per the The head of Toyo Shinkyu asked me to call it gentle, not just drill technique. But all you're doing is you're holding your needle and you're fluttering the tool back and forth. To show you with a marker, so I'm gonna always hold my needle if this was a needle, right? I'm gonna hold it just on the handle. We'll say this is just the handle and this is the shaft simply because needles are really hard to see on these kinds of videos. So you're gonna hold it straight out of your index finger and and just move your bottom thumb 
back and forth. I always kind of say kind of like you have a Parkinson's twitch. A lot of people end up trying to move their index finger. You don't want to do that because then the tip of the shaft, you can see, starts getting pretty erratic. So instead, all you do is you just move the thumb back and forth, and it's a really gentle little rock back and forth. And by doing that, you can actually create very much so a technique that resembles Easton. You can also just simply touch and let go, and this will create that fluttering technique that Easton is also very much looking like. Now, the important thing here, though, is that you're feeling for when that key arrives at your needle tip. You're really looking for here when the key arrives at your needle tip and also really understanding what you're trying to do to accomplish something in the body. Now, if we're gonna do something really simple, let's say we wanted to put it stomach 36 and spleen six, I don't know. Let's say we were trying to connect those two points. Then what we would wanna do is each point we would go in and stimulate one at a time. Now, of course, the drawbacks of doing individual needle technique is that you can't do it all at once and you can't leave the room and go treat another client while you do this. However, because you are staying with the client, because you are staying with that technique, you know exactly when the key arrives and you can really learn how that patient's body is responding how quickly that patient's body's key moves and that can help you tailor that treatment to that patient. On a side note, I'm really curious how long it takes for all of you to complete one treatment. Do you do 30 minutes? Does it take you an hour? Are you at two hours? Let me know in the comments below. So again, subtle technique in traditional Japanese medicine is really, really important. And unfortunately, when you're using Eastem, you're just not able to be as subtle as you would like. That is why I often tell people that in traditional Japanese medicine styles, whether you're in a style like the one I practice, Iyashi no Michi, or traditional Japanese meridian therapy, which I would say is the most common outside of Toyohari, you're going to want to just make sure, first of all, you follow the guidelines of that style, but also that you're really paying attention to some key factors. Now, I went into this in my last video, about how to transition your practice from TCM to TGM, but you're really gonna wanna pay, pay attention to deficiency access, cold heat, and jockey. And these are really the five basic core principles of I would say all Koho house styles, meaning return to the classic styles. Traditional Japanese meridian therapy, Iyashi no Michi, Toyohari, all of them are just trying to really get at the core root deficiency of the illness and while they do it, address the deficiency, excess cold, heat, and jockey in the body. Of course, there are some more modern styles that are a little bit more classical Chinese based and they look at those but treat a little bit differently. We're going to put those aside for now because they kind of are in their own little special category. But when it comes back to e-stem and really utilizing in your practice, you can see how it can be beneficial. Yes, it can really help certain body types, but for the most part, it doesn't help to grow your technical practice, the sensitivity of your hands of feeling when that key arrives. And also it can be a little jarring, sometimes painful, and oftentimes cause over-treatment for your client. If you're ready to dive deeper into mastering traditional Japanese medicine, acupuncture, mock specialist, shonishin, all of it, then you might want to consider joining my mentorship program at Shink University. Consistent mentorship can really elevate your skills and help you achieve more accurate and effective results in your treatment. And it can also help you transition your practice from TCM into traditional Japanese medicine. If you're interested in doing this, go ahead, click the link in the description box below and let's set up an interview and see if it's a fit for your goals. If you enjoyed this video, please give it two thumbs up, share it with your colleagues, of course, it helps them to progress their practice. And of course, subscribe to the channel for more tips and tutorials on traditional Japanese medicine. If you're interested in really transitioning your practice from TCM, to traditional Japanese medicine, you're going to want to watch my video right over here because it's going to give you some really solid tips on how to get that process started.